seated or you may just keep standing there all day if you like. I want you to feel comfortable. <laughs> wow, so good to be here at Bait Tequila. Well, I heard of using different kind of bait to catch fish, but bait tequila is a new one. <laughs> Something about a, a oak egg at the end. You got an oak egg going on after? No. <laughs> Eggnog. <laughs> oh, man, I'm telling you. Um, Josiah and the others, I know Josiah's working back there. Yeah, um, you couldn't have chosen a better song out of all the millions of songs that are out there, one that you slipped in today, um, this is my story for me. Because I grew up in a church that was full of excitement. I'm going to talk a lot about that today. Uh, part of my, so I'm going to share my story with you today. God told me to share my story. And at that church, the opening song every Sunday morning, the choir sang, this is my story. This is my song. And um, wow, they've redone it. They've, uh, what do you call that? Do you um, do uh, contemporary, contemporary but, but um, a cover, a cover. <laughs> it's a new cover on it. <laughs> but it's the same truth as kids, you know, the, the hymn, hymn book said, blessed assurance, and we thought it was blessed insurance. But there's some truth to that also. Um, when your story is wrapped up in a group of people, a community like this, <clears throat> uh, I know you know this, but um, what you do here, and you spend more time, you probably notice, than, than uh, a lot of churches do. You probably notice you're on a different day than a lot of congregations meet. Now, I will tell you that the African churches I go to, they got you beat. They're like twice as long as you guys. But... Uh, <laughs> And um, anyway, but um, what you're doing is not just having church, but you are community. You are bringing together. When you're moving in, around here um, in, in dancing and movement, uh, you're doing something as a community, as a body. That's, it's like a swaying. It's like, you know, the body has many different parts, and we are different parts of the body of Yeshua, right? And so... But what you're doing, and you're, you're moving together with other people, and I'm telling you, you guys look like a United Nations congregation. I love it. That's the way it's supposed to be. And uh, some of you, man, I, I would just know for sure that some of you are Greek, and some of you are Iranian, and all kinds of stuff, and I'm expecting when I come up to talk to you, let's go to be with you today, Pastor Roy, and uh, you're just like, hey, man, how's it going? I'm like, oh, okay. You can't judge a book by its cover. It doesn't matter. But what we are doing is a whole group of different kinds of people all coming together, one common cause. And um, getting ahead of my message, but I just wanted to, to commend you for that and to thank you, Josiah and the others. Um, just an amazing church you have here. You got Elvis leading your worship, and, and um, it's incredible. Rihanna and a few others. Okay. Just thought I'd share a little story that has absolutely nothing to do with my message today, but I wanted to share it with you because I thought it was a cute story. Uh, it's called The New Preacher. The Country Community Church hired a new preacher to replace a well-respected preacher who had retired after 40 years of service. The church was located in a very rural area with numerous farm families in the congregation. In order to get off to a good start, the new preacher decided to get out and meet the families um, that he'd be serving at their homes. One morning, he went to visit a family that had a very nice farm with a beautiful house. As he walked up to the house, he noticed there was a car parked in the carport. As he approached the door, he could hear a radio playing country music from the back of the house. He knocked at the door, and the family dog came out from under the porch to greet him, but no person answered. He knocked again and then rang the doorbell again. He thought he heard some moving around inside, but nobody came to the door or replied. After waiting a little longer, he took out a business card, and he wrote on the back of the business card, Revelation 3.20 on the back of the card, and he stuck it in the door, and he left. So then Sunday morning, <coughs> 
One of the deacons came up to the preacher after the service and asked, what is this preacher? The deacon handed him the business card that he had left earlier, and uh, somebody placed it in the offering plate with two verse references on the back of it. Under Revelation 3.20, which the preacher wrote, there was Genesis 3.10 written with very nice handwriting. He explained that he had left this card at the house and tried to visit earlier in the week. The preacher told his deacon, Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Then he opened his Bible and turned to Genesis 3.10. He blushed and giggled. Then he started laughing out loud. After he caught his breath, he read the verse to the deacon. Genesis 3.10, I heard your voice and was afraid, for I was naked in the garden. So I hid. <laughs> so, um, as I said, it has absolutely nothing to do with my message today. But I just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> so be careful when you go visit people's homes, okay? Like you said, you got to be careful if you put on the sign, come as you are, because they might. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, before I forget, I wanted to tell you about something that, we, that I've got available. By the way, Mary sends her love. Uh, she's in England with our, our son and his family. Um, our, son, our grandson turned 13 this year, and uh, he's the first of our six grandchildren. He's the oldest, so each time they turn 13, they get to go somewhere with Saba, I'm Saba, and Mimi is Mary, and uh, spend a whole week together so that we can just focus on them and them on us. And, and so someone uh, paid our way for us to bring him from Manchester to Miami, and so we got to spend a whole week together with him, we thought, because then we went to take that mandatory test you got to take before you can fly and discovered that he had COVID. I said, oh, no, I took their son from England to Miami, and he got COVID. Lord, please help me here. And uh, tested three times just to make sure, and he definitely had, but he was great. He's 13. He just, you know, had like a little cold for a day, and then it was over. Of course, we pumped some ivermectin into him quickly. And... Um, but the thing was, they made us quarantine, and they said it was going to be 10 days, but I felt like the Lord said, uh, check again in five days, and they said, no, nobody gets, you know, out in five days, but when God says something, you do what God says, so they reluctantly agreed to let us test again after five days, and uh, it was cool that our grandson got to see, you know, this operation of when you're up against a wall, up against, uh, you know, the the sea that needs to part, and after five days, they were stunned that we were all three negative, and they let us fly, and so that's why I got here in time. I wasn't sure up until that moment. That's why it was like down to the wire, and so, uh, but they had to go back to England, so but I stayed here for a few things, and uh, she sends her love and her greetings, um, but something that I do have with me, it's a DVD of Handel's Messiah. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. Uh, we, we do Handel's Messiah in Hebrew. Imagine Handel's Messiah. You get the, the theme of the whole thing is Messiah. And we're in Israel, right? Talking about Messiah. That's what this is all about. And it's 100% scripture. And the fact that we nobody had ever done it in Hebrew before. So we had it translated into Hebrew. Imagine a masterful music, a musical masterpiece like that to, to translate it, to make it fit linguistically and, uh, and for it to sound right, and, and we hire an incredible orchestra to work with us, and, and um, we put it together, and uh, we present it to Israeli audiences, and Israeli people are typically very fond of classical music of all ages. People love the classical music, and so it's just an opportunity to reach out to them. It's a classical piece. Everybody knows about Handel's Messiah. It's considered the best of the best in the classical music world. And now we're, they're saying, wow, you've got it in my own home language, in my mother tongue, you know. And, and so we do it. And um, we then suddenly had this opportunity, <clears throat> the, you know, the empty tomb in Israel. And I've had the joy of leading uh, the Easter sunrise or resurrection day, rather, sunrise uh, service 
uh, for most of the last 31 years that we've been there, I think 29 of the last 31 years, uh, to lead worship at the empty tomb. Well, we were invited to do Handel's Messiah at the empty tomb, the empty tomb as our backdrop, and we had Arab people and Jewish people, international people, and Holocaust survivors packed into that place singing Messiah. You know, the first half is all about the prophecy telling about Messiah coming. The second half is all about how Jesus, Yeshua, fulfilled those scriptures and proclaiming the Messiah. And so um, we had no idea that right after we would finish this production at the empty tomb that this thing called Corona, COVID, would come along. And in Israel, it's all Corona, Corona, it's what they call it. And, uh, and we wouldn't be able to do our concerts. I'm in this, by the way. Uh, I'm the, the fat tenor on the, towards the right there. And, um, and so we um, had no idea that we wouldn't be able to do live concerts. But thank God we had this video done by TBN, no less. TBN professional crews came and recorded it and videotaped it made this wonderful um, rendition of it available with English subtitles across the bottom. I will say uh, a few people have told me older machines, older DVD players sometimes, um, it's, it's a universal code, so it's supposed to work in all, but there's an occasional older machine, so you gotta stick it, you gotta find a, a old computer or something that still plays DVDs or whatever, or find uh, your, your kids who have a newer DVD player. And, um, but most of the time it works. <clears throat> but anyway, the thing about this, um, nobody's making money on this, but uh, the Garden Tomb who, who paid for the production of this, uh, we're, we're offering this for $20 because they get $10 just to cover their production costs, which they're still a long way from uh, recouping. But um, also, every time you buy one of this, the other $10 of your $20 uh, gives one for free to a Holocaust survivor. And so you're not just buying one for your. When you buy one for yourself, uh, and I'm there personally to to oversee it, and I, I wish I, sh I should have brought some photos of the joy on these people's face when you hand them Handel's Messiah in Hebrew for free, and because there's a soup kitchen and other things that we're reaching out to them, and to give them one of these, you'd have just thought that we handed them a thousand dollars or something. It's just incredible the joy on their face. So all that to say. Uh, it's not even helping our ministry. What's helping our ministry is to be able to minister. That's helping us to minister what God called us to do. And so um, even if you don't like classical music, uh, buy one and you'll help a Holocaust survivor. And just remember, Christmas is only 11 months and something away. Okay. Um, there's that. Could you put the, uh, the picture up of me and my Japanese friend? Oh, there it is. Oh, you're fast. Um, this is about two years ago. This gentleman right here is often referred to as the Billy Graham of Japan, or the Japanese Billy Graham. This man is incredible. He is the most well-known preacher in Japan. And uh, he is so highly respected, and, uh, and his ministry is amazing. He, he was only 86 in that picture. He's, I think he's 88 now. Might be about to turn 89 and still going strong. I mean, he just kept preaching right through COVID, right through everything, he, anywhere that, that would have him. And um, so uh, he heard me talk, and this is not my message today, but some of you have heard me talk about Israel as God's center stage, how God is using Israel. All the, you, I, mean, I know you guys already know about the, uh, this is my Bible, by the way, today. Um, little Bibles like this are great because you don't need big pulpits. Um, how hundreds of prophecies in the Bible are coming true even today in our lifetime in a place called Israel impossible things that were predicted ahead of time that God basically, you'll see it in the Bible, just a refresher, over and over, God says, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And, and it's absolutely impossible things going to happen in Israel. P.S., when it happens, you'll know I am God. 
you'll know that God is real. And clearly, exactly as it says, these things are happening even today, coming true in our lifetime. I mean, that's why we have this community together. That's why we get excited. That's why we spend hours of our Shabbat together. That's why we, we read the word. That's why we sing songs with, with such passion and such strong desires because we get it. God is real. His kingdom is real. And we get to partake in that and still enjoy life as well. It's not just all about church meetings. It's not just all about, you know, uh, like uh, Derek Prince used to say, don't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. We can have an amazing, incredible life, but this is part of it. But a lot of people just go to church and do the thing because of religious duty, and they think their sacrifice of praise is I sacrificed for God because I sat there for a whole hour or two, and, and I endured that because I love God. Getting nothing out of it. So anyway, my point is, because of Israel, because of God's center stage, and because of him proving himself. You see, in Japan, I preached this message, and I didn't know that this gentleman was in the audience. It was at a conference. His name, if you want to write it down, is, is Kiichi Arega. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you how to spell it. <laughs> in Japanese, you spell it Kiichi Arega. <laughs> Sensei. <laughs> yes, Daniel son. <laughs> um, he's on Facebook too, and he'll, he'll accept you as a friend. Uh, just go to my page and you'll find his picture on there and click on there and he'll accept you because he's just all about reaching people from all generations. Anyway, so, so this message, uh, I was uh, actually happened to be at the right place at the right time, which I'm also going to talk about today. My whole life has just been showing up and, and God do something unexpected. So I was in Japan doing some other stuff, and I went to this meeting because I thought I had a day off, only to find out that the keynote speaker didn't show up, and they said, hey, Mr. Guy from Israel, can you fill in today? Sure, Okay. I did, and he was in the audience, and I didn't know who he was, but I talked about Israel being God's center stage. And afterwards, he came up to me, and he said, thank you for speaking. About he said, I have preached the gospel for more than 50 years. I have taken dozens of groups to Israel, and today is the first time that I understood why Israel is important today. God just revolution. He said, in Japan, we have thousands of gods, thousands of religions, and each one claiming this, claiming that. It's all a bunch of uh, nothing provable. But you have just explained why what we have is provable because it was written in advance and happening even today in our life. It just, he said, anytime you come to Japan, I want you to be by my side. I said, brother, if I, can, I found out later who he was. I didn't even know at that time. But when I found out who he was, I said, brother, if I can just carry your Bible and put it on the podium and walk away, I'd be happy to do that. He goes, no, nope, we go 50-50. He said, you speak about that, then I speak my message. I said, well, it's not really 50-50 because in my 50, everything I say, you have to translate. So I'm really like 20. No. <laughs> he even likes my humor. And um, so... We've become really good friends, and I've had several opportunities to go with him, and God even had me start a um, Hebrew-Japanese worship CD. And all I need now is to go back and add the Japanese, but it's been on pause for two years because I can't get back into Japan yet. And I say that just as a prayer request to you because because uh, you can actually minister back to us with your prayer. So I appreciate that. But um, thank you. We can leave that up if you want. But um, I want to share a story that happened my last, on my last trip back to Japan. I had an overnight stayover in Thailand on my way to Japan. And um, I got to Thailand and took the shuttle taxi to the hotel where I was going to stay. And on the way, I saw a Burger King. Now, when you're in a foreign country and you've gotten sick in foreign countries eating the local food, 
I, I usually eat it anyway, but I've also gotten real. I mean, I, I re- deathly sick one time in Thailand. So when I saw Burger King on my way to the hotel, I said, yes, thank you, Lord. The King of Kings has provided the Burger King. And I made a note of it, and I noticed as the taxi was winding back to the hotel that it was a little over a mile away, but I remembered how to get back to it. And um, But um, I had not eaten in over 24 hours, and so I was really hungry. So I made my way uh, towards that Burger King after I got settled at the hotel, got all the way to Burger King, thanking God for this Burger King, right? It's because it's American, not because it's fast food, but it's American. It's something you know pretty well what you're getting, and they have free Wi-Fi all over the world at Burger King at McDonald's. So I walk in the door, and I'm thinking, what am I going to have? And I clearly heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, don't eat here. (laughs) Say, what? That must be the devil. (laughs) (laughs) But I knew it wasn't the devil. I knew it was the Lord. I mean, just to be sure, I sat down. (laughs) Inside, I sat down. I said, I'm going to just wait on the Lord here. For 10 minutes, the Lord kept saying, don't eat here, don't eat here, don't eat here. I'm like, I'm telling you this story so you can apply things in your own life, okay? So keep in mind, this could be you if we just listen. Now, keep in mind that um, COVID had just come out. It had just been announced. And everybody in America uh, and even in Israel, they were saying, yeah, but it's only in Asian countries, I'm in Thailand now. <laughs> and so the, uh, you know, the places where it was the most concerned where I, was where I happened to be. So, okay, so I got up and I said, Lord, you're just going to have to show me. I'm going to walk back to the hotel on the way. Just show me where you want me to eat. And there was just all kinds of places. No, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, I could almost hear angel choirs. There was a sign that said, Ronnie's American-style pizza. And I said, Father God, (laughs) may I? (laughs) And the Lord said, that's where I want you to eat. Wow, okay. So I went in and I got me some Ronnie's American-style pizza and uh, and a Coke, and I, I even asked the Lord, where should I sit? He showed me which table to sit at. And, um... As I was sitting, and then this music came on, and then, no. As I'm sitting, I'm facing the street. I'm eating my pizza, and I notice there's a big crowd of people uh, across the street. I'm thinking, I wonder what's going on. There's some kind of something like a crowd has gathered, and I I wonder what it is. And uh, by the time I finished my pizza, I really felt the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go into the middle of that crowd of people. Now, first rule of travel when you're away from into another country is don't go into the middle of a crowd of people <laughs> that you don't know if you're in Bangkok, Thailand, especially, especially with this new thing called COVID-19, you know, with all the people packed in. And, but when the Lord says it, you got to be obedient. Paid my bill, went out the door, pressed my way through the crowd, got into the middle, probably 100 people gathered around. And there's a guy on the sidewalk, leaned, propped up against a brick wall, lifeless, bald-headed guy with, with blood and scars all over his head. And don't mean to get too gross here. You'll hopefully forget about this before the O-keg, I mean the O-neg dinner. But I mean, blood, like dried blood is just caked down a side coming from his mouth. And he's laying there, his shirt is kind of up And I'm watching his stomach. There's no movement. And so I asked somebody, I said, what happened? They said, we don't know. We just stumbled on him like this. And there's another guy knelt down beside him who's just crying and crying. And uh, he was an American guy. I said, what's going on here? He goes, that's my buddy. He said, from England. He said, "Uh, we we were out partying last night, and, and we agreed to meet back here, but I didn't. 
I don't know what happened to him. I just came here, and there he is like this. And I don't know what to do, man, because he's not breathing and all this stuff. And and uh, he had taken his wallet, and he was trying to figure out, you know, what to do next. And, and I asked around. The people said, we called for an ambulance 45 minutes ago and never came yet. And and so people were just standing there like, what to do? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to lay hands on this man's head. And I'm going, you do mean the bloody head <laughs> with the COVID-19 going around? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, you're real. You're human. You have to ask the questions, but still the Holy Spirit said yes. He said, I want you to speak life into this man. When you know it's God, I just reached over, put my hand on his head, and I said, I speak life into this man in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, his stomach went boom, boom, boom. And the people were like, whoa, what's going on? And he starts muttering and <laughs> moving around. And, and, uh, and then suddenly, as if right on cue, the ambulance shows up. And um, their ambulance is a pickup truck with a blue light on top. And two paramedics jump out of the, this truck, put the flatbed down on the, the, the truck trailer down, and I help them lift this guy up and hoist him up onto the back of the, the, uh, the flatbed pickup. And uh, his friend jumped up, and they put the tailgate up. And... Uh, they didn't administer anything to him, but I saw some gauze. I said to his friend, I said, here, you know, I am also a um, therapist. And I said, just make sure he doesn't drown on his own, you know, blood or something. I said, have this ready to douse if you need to. And uh, his friend is like, thank you, man. Thank you. And I just shook his hand. I said, man, God loves you. And he, tell your friend, God really loves him too. I said, it's the power of God. And, and the truck just drove off. I mean, his hand just slid out of mine like it was a scene out of a movie or something. You know, just dramatic. You know, goodbye. <laughs> and I thought, what just happened? And this, this uh, guy from Thailand, I guess you call him a Thai guy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you could do couldn't stick me like glue from the Thai guy. Okay, anyway. Keeping it real. And uh, he comes up to me. He says, man, it was that guy's lucky day that you were here today. I said, well, first of all, it's not his lucky day. I said, God just wanted me to be here. I didn't tell him, but I wanted to be a Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> and I could have missed it, right? He said, no, I'm an off-duty paramedic. I worked on this guy 45 minutes ago. He's been gone for 45 minutes. So, I got to share the gospel with that guy, going back to my hotel. And I had some Ronnie's American-style pizza in me, too. So, my point is, we just need to listen. We just need to show up where God says show up. I didn't preach a sermon. I mean, my first thought was, wow, I got me a crowd now. He's, you know, he came to life, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, and all of a sudden the ambulance shows up, and by the time we got him on the truck, the crowd was gone. I was like, man, there goes my Billy Graham moment right there. But that's okay. They saw the power of God at work, and we leave the rest up to him. So I wanted to share that story because um, I'm going to, um, yes, testimony. You know, there's a verse of Scripture. Let's, let's throw up the Scripture um, from Amos chapter 9. Amos 9, um, is one of those many verses that the Bible talks about Israel. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant the vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. I will plant them. Remember, now this is a place that was so desolate that the world powers, the Turkish Empire, Ottoman Empire, British Empire, nobody could do because God said it's going to be desolate until I say. So he says, I'm going to plant them on their land and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. That is one of the many things 
that's coming to pass even in our lifetime today. He's bringing them back. Your brother prayed from the north, south, east, and west, and we borrow a lot from what God's doing for Israel, which he wants us to do. Everything he does for Israel is to show us what he'll do for us. And he's bringing them back from the north, the south, the east, and the west. But you need to understand how impossible this is. You might say Israel was never qualified for the job. Israel has never, God didn't say, and once they all become CPAs and lawyers and doctors, and once they all do this, and one, then I will qualify them, and they will know how to do these things. No, because you know what? The CPAs and the lawyers and the doctors, they didn't come back at first. It was just uh, some religious Orthodox Hasidic Jews that would dance around, you know, and, and they didn't know anything about farming, and they didn't know anything about anything. They just showed up, and God told them what to do. God gave them the, the idea for drip irrigation. God gave them, gave them the idea how to take the Galilee, which was a swamp, how to turn it into fresh water. They didn't know how, but God showed them how. They weren't qualified, but God brought them. They didn't know how to do anything, but they showed up because God brought them back. That's what God wants you to hear today. Just show up. And I'm telling you what you are doing with your kids. One of the best blessings of my morning, of my day, has been, sister with the orange scarf, your little boy, dancing around here, and he saw... His shadow, because once you get up here, you got like all these shadows, and it's you. And he, he was just dancing with his own shadow, and the shadow would go up here and back here, and then he said, oh, there it is again. And I thought, that's like us dancing with the Lord, you know? And he was having a good time at church. They don't even know what we're talking about most of the time in here at certain ages. They just know it's exciting. And they know something happens to mom and dad when they come here. That's when I knew God was real. I was eight years old. I shared this earlier this morning. I was eight years old, and my dad, my dad didn't know the Lord. My dad was angry at God because he tried to play his music when he was a kid. And uh, he jazzed up Amazing Grace, and they told him, you can never play here again. Brought the devil's music into church. So the church didn't want him, so he went to the world. You see, if, if the church doesn't embrace the kids here, they'll find people that will embrace them. And so I applaud everything you're doing. I wish I had the 20000 or whatever you need to add on for more room for your kids to have space. Anything you can do to get the kids. Imagine the world they are facing today that we never had to face. We thought we had it tough. Yes, we did have it tough, and we had to walk 20 miles half naked through the snow to get to school every day and all of that. We didn't face the stuff in this world that they are up against today, the Internet and, and uh, the things that kids know at such an early age today and the, the, the people that they're surrounded with out there in the world. We need a place, a safe haven, not shield them completely from the world. They need to see what the world has to offer, but when they see what the people of God have to offer, love and acceptance. Uh, a noted uh, world-renowned psychologist told me one time, the, the deepest need in, in anybody from any country in the world could be summed up this way. You walk into a room, and there are people there that are happy to see you. And our kids will find that place, and it ought to be here. So I applaud that. So everything in your life, what is your life calling? Do you feel that you're, you're on the right trajectory? You know, those, those charts that show when things are going good and when things took a dive. Where is, your, where, where is your trajectory right now in terms of do you feel that your life is, is headed where it's supposed to be headed? And a lot of people don't know. They're like, I just don't know. I wish I knew. Well, I'm telling you, ask God where you're supposed to be today and tomorrow, and be there. End of story. End of story. And every day when you go and you say, all I know is I'm where God told me to be today, suddenly satisfaction. 
sense of accomplishment, knowing you're on the right trajectory. That, well, but nothing spectacular happened. I didn't raise anybody from the dead. I didn't either yesterday or today or all the other days. But you never know what's going to happen. So, let me tell you something about Israel. Listen up. This list is kind of long, but I feel like I'm supposed to read it. This is the place that was unqualified, okay? Israel is only one-sixth of one percent of the landmass in the Middle East. One-sixth of one percent. This is the country that the world's trying to say, you should give half it away and you should, just for the sake of peace. Israel is roughly half the size of Lake Michigan, the entire nation. The Sea of Galilee is 695 feet below sea level. It's the lowest freshwater lake in the world. The Dead Sea is the lowest surface point on Earth, about 1,300 feet below sea level. Israel is the only nation in the world that entered the 21st century with a net gain in its number of trees. Jericho is the oldest continuously inhabited town in the world. The Mount of Olives in Jerusalem is the oldest continually used cemetery in the world. Israel's population is half the size of metro New York City. Israel has only 2% of the population of the Middle East. Israel has the highest ratio of university degrees per capita in the world. Israel produces more scientific papers per capita than any other nation in the world by a large margin. Israel has the highest number of scientists and technicians per capita in the world by a large margin. Israel has the highest number of engineers per capita in the world. Israel has the highest number of PhDs per capita in the world. Israel has the highest number of physicians per capita in the world. Israel has the largest percentage of its workforce employed in technical professions in the world. Israel is the largest immigrant absorbing nation in the world per capita. Israel is the only country in the Middle East where the Christian population has grown over the last 50 years. Hmm. Israel is the only country in the Middle East where Christians, Muslims, and Jews alike are free to vote. Israel is the only country in the Middle East where women enjoy full political rights. Mary's trying to call me. Call me back, Mary. Economically, listen up. Israel has the largest number of startup companies per capita in the world. Israel is the world's largest wholesale diamond center, financially, or finally, rather, surpassing Antwerp in the 1970s. Most of the cut and polished diamonds of the world come from Israel. Israel has the largest number of NASDAQ-listed companies outside the U.S. and Canada on the stock exchange. Israel was the first country to have a free trade agreement with the United States. Apart from the Silicon Valley, Israel has the highest concentration of high-tech companies in the world. Don't get bored with this. Just get stirred, okay? The cell phone was developed in Israel at Motorola's largest development center. The voicemail technology was developed in Israel in the early 80s. IBM chose an Israeli-designed computer chip as the brains for its first personal computers. The first antivirus software for computers was developed in Israel. Most of the Windows NT and XP operating systems were developed in Israel by Microsoft. Both the Pentium 4 and Centrino Processors were entirely designed, developed, and produced in Israel. On and on it goes. Pentium chip technology designed in Israel. Israel was the first Middle Eastern country to launch a satellite. Hebrew is the only case of a dead national language being revived in all of world history. Hebrew had not been spoken as a native tongue by anyone for centuries, Today, it's the native tongue of millions of people. Israel has more museums per capita 
than any other nation. Israel has more orchestras per capita. Israel publishes more books per capita than any other nation. Israel publishes, publishes more books translated from other languages from any other nation. Now spammers are trying to call me. The most independent and free Arabic press in the Middle East is in Israel. Israel has the largest fleet of F-16 aircraft outside the U.S., the world's most impenetrable airline security. Ever flying to Israel? You know what I'm talking about? And all those delays, just thank God, because that's why you're so safe there. Israel spends more money per capita on its protection than any other country in the world. Okay, almost done, but listen up. Israel's dairy cows are the most productive in the world. Somebody says, holy cow, say, let me tell you about the holy cows. <laughs> Israel's cows, get this now, Israel's cows average 25,400 pounds of milk per cow per year. Okay, keep that number in mind. Compared to just 18,700 pounds from American cows. 17,000 from Canadian cows, 13,000 from European cows, 10,000 from Australian cows, and 6,600 from Chinese cows. Israel has more in vitro fertilization per capita than anywhere in the world, and it's free. Israelis per capita are the world's biggest consumers of fruits and vegetables. This is a nation that was unqualified and actually still is unqualified because it's a tiny little nation. In the Middle East, Israel's like a matchbox in the middle of a football field. Comparison-wise, it's very similar. The rest of the football field would be all of the, the uh, Muslim nations surrounding Israel. The Muslim religion has vowed for the destruction of Israel. Okay, And yet Israel continues to exist. They will be no more pulled up out of the land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Israel stands as a testimony to the God of Israel. Israel was unqualified. Israel didn't do anything to earn these blessings. Israel receives these blessings because God, it's his character, it's his name, it's his reputation, because he said, I'm going to do it, and I'm doing it for you that when I do it for you, the world will know who I am. So stop, please stop feeling beat down by the enemy and well, I'm not worthy. I could never walk down the street and lay hands on somebody's bloody head. I could never go to Israel. I could never go to prime ministers and do this. Yes, you can. If that's where God tells you to be tomorrow. I thought I was a successful pastor over in Vero Beach, Florida for 12 years. Our church grew from less than 100 people, 1,500 people. We were doing productions for 8,000 people a couple times a year, television and radio, and, and we weren't slowing down. We were expecting more. <laughs> but one day, God said, I don't want you to be there. I want you to be somewhere else. And the somewhere else was Israel. And God loves to make it really difficult so that we'll know it was him when it happens. Because I finally had enough money to take my family to dinner once in a while. We had just built a new house. Had a satellite dish in the back, back when satellite dishes were half the size of this room. Remember those big giant? My brother had the company and he gave it to me, but I had one. Finally able to kind of do a couple things. And God said, would you be willing to move your family to Israel? God said it through this man named Johann Lukoff, head of a Christian embassy, sat me down at lunch one day out of the blue. I had no idea what was coming. 
He said, I want you to pray about moving your family here. I said, well, wait a minute, move, move my family? I mean, I'd already helped there a couple of years for Feast of Tabernacles, but he says, yeah, we really need you over in Israel. I said, well, wait a minute. I mean, uh, <laughs> you got to ask the question, right? Some of you heard me say this. Um, I would have to at least ask, um, what would the salary be? <laughs> he said, that's, that's the only problem. We can't pay you anything. <laughs> Here's what I said to him, though. Yeah, I, I, but the words that popped out of my mouth, I said, that can't be God. That's impossible. <laughs> what did I just say? God can do anything, but it's different when it's your salary. When it's your paycheck, because I knew, even though we finally had gotten to the point where we could do those things, I knew that my last paycheck at Central Assembly of God in Vero Beach, Florida, there was going to be nothing left in the bank. It was paycheck to paycheck. And, um, but I also, here's the difference. Here's the difference. I knew something was happening from the Holy Spirit. I like to say God's supernatural invaded my natural. Now, see, that's the difference. I said, show up where God says show up. Lord, am I where I'm supposed to be? Yes, you are. Okay, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to go tomorrow? Okay, I'll show you. I want you to go here. And then sometimes he tells you to do something so impossible. But his supernatural will invade don't go out there trying goofy stuff just because God can do anything and I'm going to prove it and whatever, whatever. People going around just praying for everybody because God heals everybody. Well, ask him. God had to tell me to put hands on that guy. But when he does, the supernatural hits your natural, and you know it. And for a big move like that, believe me, he sent hundreds of confirmations. That's a story in itself, but... I had to listen. You see, what nobody knew was that I was unqualified for the job. I was unqualified to do what I was doing in Vero Beach. I always said <laughs> the best kept secret in Vero Beach, Florida is that Roy Kendall doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> Let me just back up a little bit to my story, and we've got just a little bit of time left, and we'll wrap this up. I told you about my dad. I was eight years old. I knew God was real because I saw a change in my dad. This church let him play his jazzy music. He became the music director at the church. And it, was, it became the 10th largest church in America back in the 60s. And so all of the guest speakers, I mean, we had Oral Roberts and we had Lester Sumrall and all kinds of people and the best singing groups and... Um, I remember some of you don't know who this guy is, but uh, a, group, a group called the Truth uh, group came. I think it was Truth. But anyway, uh, they said, we just discovered that our drummer can sing. And so they had him get off the drums and come and sing a solo, and he just blew the place away. And his name was Larnell Harris. <laughs> so I was there when Larnell Harris had his debut at Abundant Life Memorial Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, before we moved to Florida. And I mean, people after people just grouped. I mean, some of you really won't know who I'm talking about, but Roy Rogers and Dale Evans came there. They brought Trigger with them. <laughs> they made church exciting, right? Colonel Sanders came and shared his testimony at our church. And we had, nobody even knew what KFC was back then. It was Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he shared his testimony, and we had chicken on the grounds for everybody, but all the neighborhood kids came over and took all the chicken, and, uh, and we ran out of chicken, and we couldn't even give Colonel Sanders his own chicken. <laughs> but you know, stuff like that, just as a kid, is so exciting, and, and uh, the church children's group, and the youth group, and the, the choirs, and the dramas, and people coming, and people getting excited, and people getting saved, and filled with the Holy Spirit and this, all this supercharge going all the time. When I was 10 years old, a man came to our church named Morris Sorello. Morris Sorello uh, at that time was uh, 
it was before um, Reinhard Bonnke and other people were doing some of their big crusades, and he was known all over the world. But he had a healing ministry at that time that actually onwards even then on, went on. But um, I was 10 years old. He came to our church. Auditorium held 2,000 people, which in that day was massive. Still is large. But um, he came. He was on a platform. I'm 10 years old, right? I don't know where I was in, in the room somewhere. But my Sunday school teacher, Holly Clifford, uh, was about 55 years old, and she had a tumor so big that she looked like she was eight months pregnant. And, uh, and she was standing somewhere down around over there. He was on the platform. He just felt a word of knowledge from the Lord. And he just turned to her, and he pointed like this with his hand like this. He said, God is healing you. And as soon as he did that, she fell on her back. And I'm 10 years old. I thought he shot and killed Hallie Clifford. <laughs> So what does a 10-year-old kid do? Man, I ran over and I I stood over her and I watched laying on her back. I watched her stomach go boom, 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 boom. Completely flat. Every day I say, Lord, would you do that for me? He he says, you came by that differently. You got to... I'm down 15 since I was here last, but I got a long way to go. But um, I saw that. I saw the miracle power of God. My brother's best friend. See, these are people that I knew. My brother's best friend, they were teenagers, and he had a broken leg, a cast all the way up to his hip and all the way down his leg. And he came up, and Brother Sorello uh, just put his hand right here, and when he did, you just heard this pop sound. And his name is Mark. And Mark said, it's healed, it's healed. Again, I'm 10 years old. Mark jumps off the platform with his cast on, and he lands, but I'm watching him, and I'm laughing because he looks like a penguin running with his cat, and he runs all the way around the auditorium, and, but it was exciting, and the next day, Mark went to the doctor, and they said, it's not broken anymore. They cut the cast off. You see, I saw many, many more miracles. Blessed is he who has not seen and believes. But when you have seen the power of God, you can never doubt God. And I'm thankful for a church that believed in miracles and incubated me. I was in that that greenhouse of God's community, family, people, ups and downs, yes, problems, issues galore, yes, but life, life. The name of the church was Abundant Life. Every Sunday morning, this is my story. This is my song. God said, speak life to that man. I knew it. When you spend time with the family of God, when you spend time in his word, yes, but you spend time where it's exciting because God, his work, his everything is exciting. It begins to be part of the fiber of who you are because I knew John 10.10 The thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Don't think that he's not out finding a way to destroy you, to rob from you. Don't think that he's not trying with your kids. Well, my my kids aren't in the house anymore. Well, if you've got grandkids, if you've got other kids, if you've got neighborhood kids, find a way to get them. Get them into a place where there's life and pray, 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 pray for them to be surrounded with life. So I knew the same verse that starts off, the thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, but I came that you might have, and I say might, I think it's because it's our choice. You can be bored to death and still make it to heaven and get there for eternity and say, all I care about is I made it here. But you're going to be hearing all kinds of stories of people that share. But when I was there, man, I saw God do something supernatural. You can be thankful that you're there, but don't miss out what's available here. Because I have grown up 
knowing that he didn't just say life more abundantly, like life to the fullest. I've heard it preached a lot of times, life to the fullest. No, life in the Greek there was Zoe. Zoe life is supernatural life. Wow. Ended up in 12 different schools because we moved around a lot. The uh, desegregation in the 60s. I was a child of that era. And uh, thankfully, uh, because of racial inequality, they were starting to blend things up, mix things up. But it wasn't an easy transition. Anybody remember those days? It's hard today, but man, back at that time, it was really, really a whole different story. And uh, I was growing up through that. Never made it to Bible college. I thought I was going to Bible college. 15 years old, we moved down to Florida, and I am wrapping this up, I promise. Thought I was going to college. I was even offered a scholarship where I could get a musical scholarship on my voice. I didn't know how to play the piano or anything, but they liked the way I sang, and they offered me a musical scholarship and said, we'll have you on Broadway one day. That was out there. And uh, at least I had some bragging rights on that. And then uh, I thought, boy, I'm called into the ministry. Maybe I need to go to Bible college. As I'm trying to decide all this, all of a sudden, God sends this girl named Mary into my life. And I'm like, anybody seen, um, oh, what is it? Uh, Little Mermaid? Is it Little Mermaid where the, what critter is it that gets Twitter pated? Oh, that's in Bambi. I'm sorry. <laughs> thumper, thumper. I was Twitter pated. But I also knew the voice of God. And God said, I want you to marry that girl. But she's three years older than me. I'm 18. She's 21. All of this and all of that. But I'm supposed to do this. I thought I'm supposed to do that. I'm, I'm too young. I'm not ever I'm going to wait. God said, but I'm telling you. I'm so glad I listened to God. And I got married at 18. Still planning to go to Bible college. But I said, well, we, and then Chip came along. <laughs> and I said, okay, but I'm going to work nights. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do whatever I got to do. I'm going to save up some money so that we can go to Bible college and I'll go to classes and I'll work night there and I'll, I got to get my, my uh, degree so I can become a licensed minister of the gospel. Well, meanwhile, and here's the thing, here's the catch. Hang on here for yourself. I was in a congregation, and I got busy. I got involved. I helped clean up after the Oneg. <laughs> I helped. I, I carried so many church tables and folded and unfolded and did everything that I could but also, they needed somebody to help with the children. I helped with the children. They needed somebody to help with the youth. I helped with the youth. They needed somebody to help with the music. What I didn't tell you was uh, the church before that, I couldn't play the piano, but there was nobody to play the piano. My dad was a piano player, and I felt terribly inferior, but he taught me a couple of chords. So I used to tell the people, if I stop playing, you keep singing, and I'll catch up to you. I wasn't qualified, but somebody had to do it. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And by doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it, I got some skill. I got some ability. I wrapped myself. I surrounded myself with other musicians, guitar players, drummers, and, and that's before they had soundtracks that you could play along with and all that. Praise God for today's technology. But I just got involved on my way to Bible college so that I could be qualified. Then the church called me and said, could we hire you now? But I didn't go to Bible college. Yeah, but you're doing the job now better than people coming out of Bible college. <laughs> Your grounding in the word is more than most Bible college students. So I took the job at 19 years old, full-time, just before I turned 20, did night school correspondence Bible college, because the internet wasn't around yet, if anybody can believe, before the internet. And had to mail in my test results and get them mailed back to me and 
just kept going where God said to go. And in the next 12 years, that church grew. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I did what God said. Finally, after 12 years, feeling like, I still don't feel qualified, but at least we did it, right? Whew. Somehow we did it. And I uh, surrounded myself with people who were qualified, and, and I was a motivator, and I got them to do it. Finally thinking, okay, we can retire here one day. We can just ride this thing out, however it's supposed to go. And God says, uh, Roy, would you move your family to Israel? I had no idea. Again, I thought, these people think I'm qualified, and I'm not qualified. But God said it. And that was 31 years ago. And since then, I'm telling you today, I am still not qualified. But God has taken me to 63 nations since then. And I have been able to personally minister to the last five prime ministers of Israel, to queens, to kings, parliament members, not because of any great skill, but I just know I'm where I'm supposed to be. And now we're faced with a new situation. I forgot to ask you when I was telling about Handel's Messiah, were you playing any of those? Did you put any of those slides up? No, <laughs> do that at the end, at the end. If you'll just start that other batch of slides, I'll just wrap it up with this. God finally got us there. Some of you heard our testimony. Mary was here. Mary shared uh, last time when I couldn't be here. These are just some slides of our, of our ministry house in Israel. that will just let them go uh, while I'm telling you this so we can wrap up because Pastor Nick and Tikva said that they'd like, to pray over, like you to pray over us because you can bless us with your prayers today. Um, after 31 years on a tourist visa, supposed to be impossible, uh, every time we went, God blinded the eyes of the, the um, passport control people, and they let us in when they were not supposed to. And for 31 years, and then after 31 years, God did a miracle that we didn't even ask him for, but he gave us a clergy visa, which is good for life. Now... The idea, the excitement, so thrilling. Wow, now we don't even have to pray that God blinds their eyes again. We say, look what we got when we come to passport control. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's given us a house, as you can see, given us a car uh, that we just got, and uh, all of these things. And then even because we both had COVID, some of you know my story, uh, I was one day away from death with COVID, and, and God got me some hydroxychloroquine and zithromycin and budesonide. Uh, and the doctor said, man, if, if I hadn't have seen you today, you'd be dead tomorrow. And those things, boom, just within three days healed. And um, all these things that God has done and, and just underscored and verified. And some of you have seen that movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I'm bonafide. We're bonafide. In Israel, and all this exciting, well, thank you, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, here we are. After our COVID, Israel had this rule that said, if you can prove proof of recovery with antibodies, you don't need to be vaccinated. So, man, we proved that. We went even to, we proved it from the States. We got to Israel and proved it again with their own laboratories and said, look at this. We're, you know, uh, got antibodies. Everything was good. Uh, they had this stupid green pass thing you got to have. Israel's doing it. I don't understand how they can get into all this, but they've, they've taken it because of fear and hook, line, and sinker. They bought into it and wanted to be the first country fully vaccinated, and now they're green pass. But they let Roy and Mary have one because they have antibodies. Their own scientists, a science in Israel says if you have antibodies, you, you have 27, this is the number they came up with, 27 times more um, uh, protection than the vaccine. So um, we left to go celebrate our grandson's bar mitzvah on December 27th that God did, provided, paid for it, everything, Manchester to Miami. December 31st, our green pass expired, 
And I said, okay, we're going to renew that green pass. Spent hours on the phone with the Ministry of Health waiting. Finally got a hold of somebody that said, oh, now the rule has changed. You have to have one vaccine shot to go with your antibodies. I'm not here to argue pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine. I'm here to argue whatever God says. And we have strong natural antibodies. And right now, their rule says we can't come back unless we get a jab. It can change tomorrow. And I'm here asking you to pray because we are up against the Red Sea again and we need it to part Honestly, if God told us, now Israel's coming out with their own vaccine that is a real vaccine, like the good old days, the safe kind, it sort of, you know, <laughs> safe enough anyway. Uh, we don't know when it's going to come out. If we have to wait for that, we will. But um, we don't feel with our, in fact, um, my personal history with vaccines is such that, especially with my antibodies that I have now, I am at a high risk if I take a vaccine, of having a serious reaction. So that's, I share all these miracle stories and then I say, we need a miracle <laughs> because that's life. God takes us from victory to victory and from mountaintops, but then you go through the valley and you come back to the next mountaintop. And I can't wait to come back and share how this miracle happened. I'll turn it back to you, brother. Just show up. <laughs> okay. David Loden. David Loden. He was here. He's he's visited. Yeah, David Loden is the Handel's Messiah uh, orchestra leader. Correct. David Loden, an awesome man of God. So we want to, uh, if I could just stand up and extend your hands, I'm going to anoint Roy, and we're just going to believe for not only for him, but for the whole house of Israel, for everyone that loves Israel, that wants to go and be a part, uh, the commonwealth, as we would say in Ephesians 2, uh, that we are part of the commonwealth of Israel, we're grafted in. We want to just pray that the, the Father is going to make a, a serious way for tourism, for tourists to be able to go over there and uh, be safe and, and well and everything. So let's, uh, let's anoint our, our brother here, hallelujah. Father, right now, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, I anoint this man of God. Roy is your son, and he has a measure of faith, and now he's in the valley of decision, Father. You have many options for Roy and Mary that he doesn't even know about yet, but Father, you will give them the perfect plan that if his faith is to do the things that you've put into his heart to do and to follow, he will not be forced. No mandate can override you, Father. For even the Constitution of America is greater than a mandate because we have unalienable rights. We have liberty and to pursue happiness, Father. And so what the government is trying to put on us is not happiness. It's not the Constitution. It's not our free will. It's being forced. But, Father, right now we speak against that in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. We just believe in the restoration of regathering the whole house of Israel all over the world. And Roy and Mary are a part of that, Father. He's a, he's a minstrel. He's, he's, a, he's a psalmist. And, Father, you have just used him in many, many ways uh, and, and just gifted him, Father. And so we just believe right now blessings over Roy and Mary's family, their grandkids, all their children. Father, we're just thanking you for traveling mercies, and we're thanking you for provision that everything's paid for, everything's done. And so, Father, we just thank you for Roy. We thank you, Father, that he won't be driven. He will be led. And this will be an example for all those because you brought him this far, you're going to bring him the rest of the way. Father, thank you. If you bring Roy and Mary to it, you will bring them through it. In the name of Yeshua of Nazareth, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's good, man. That's awesome. And so we want to, uh, Roy is actually going to do our closing song today. And we want to receive an offering for Roy and Mary Kendall, if you can make your checks out to Bait to Gila. And I do have some really good news. You know, I believe we are an Acts church. And how many of you know in the book of Acts, you had guest speakers, right? Okay, two people are excited. I'll tell you what it's...
But anyway, Roy is going to be with us Monday night. We're not going to be doing our small group Bible study on Monday night. We're going to have Roy Kendall. He's going to share a lot more. There's a lot more to share, a lot more to, to know, because it is exciting. Amen? And then maybe you can get to know Roy and Mary Kendall so well that you can uh, stay at their house. <laughs> hey, I like your house, Roy. It's beautiful. So, Father, we just thank you for this time uh, of giving, of receiving an offering for Roy and Mary Kendall. Father, this is seed money right now. We're planting seed into a couple that's in Israel, Father, that has a mission, that has a purpose. They have their own plan there that you've given them, Father. So we just plant seed into that right now, Father. We just believe for this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Velo Yishan Lo Yanum Velo Yishan Hine Lo Yanum Velo Yishan Shomer Yisrael He who watches Israel Never slumbers nor sleeps, neither slumbers nor sleeps, never slumbers nor sleeps. And he who watches over you as well, never slumbers nor sleeps, neither slumbers nor sleeps. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, O oh, city of God, peace within thy gates, joy within thy streets, Jerusalem, I bless you. Is he? 